It's time for the Wrestling Perspective podcast. That's Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell, and uh, we're not going to do emails this week. We promise we'll get to them next week, but we wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Jay Briscoe. And Lars and I, we were smart enough to realize that we didn't have a a great relationship or a bad relationship with Jay to sit here and remember him as professional. So we reached out to somebody who had several phenomenal tweets to bring them on to talk about Jay because Lars, let's be honest, uh, there have been some phenomenal busted opens. Uh, remembrance of him was amazing and nobody will be able to top that. But we wanted to do Jay right by talking to somebody who had a great relationship and just remember him that way today. No, absolutely. I think that Jay Briscoe and the Briscoe brothers, the impact that they've had on the, the sport of professional wrestling is insurmountable. I mean, it's like they are, I mean, what they were doing were, uh, you know, in my mind, in my opinion, was so ahead of its time. And, you know, the guy, I, you know, it's just, it's so, it's very, it's a very sad story, but you know, obviously having a long relationship with Ace and super happy to have you on the, on the, on the show Ace. Cause I know, you know, your, your tryout match. I mean, I know that you tweeted it and stuff, but your tryout match for ring of honor, Jay Brace, Jay Briscoe was the, was the guy that you got in the ring with. I mean, you know, I, you gotta have a, you know, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words tonight, but that's why I'm, I'm happy that you're here. Happy to be back. Happy to be with you guys. Um, you know, under these circumstances, it's exactly why I wanted to talk. If you, if you just simply call and ask, would you talk about Jay? Shit, yeah, I will. I, and and I've said this, a lot of people have sent me condolences today because I, I put out messages, tweets, you know, just a quick, because it, it hits you when you know somebody. And I'm not going to pretend like I knew him or we kept in great touch all these years, but it's the wrestler bond that you have when you like somebody, when you have that love, when you've been in the ring and shared that love with them and you shared, you know, the camaraderie of taking each care of each other in the ring and not killing each other, even though, you know, what our art is. Um, yeah, he was my, and like that occurred to me talking to my wife last night about him, like, oh, stunned, like everybody that's in close contact with me. Um, it just kind of brings y'all together and it, it, it just hit me. Like I couldn't believe it. Um, he was, I looked it up. It was 2002. It was, I didn't realize I was ever on a final battle, but that was the first final battle, I believe. Um, and my tryout match, Gabe Sapolsky had seen me work when he was putting together the second City Saints idea. He had seen me work because uh, Punker, CM Punk had, you know, just recommended me. Gabe was like, hey, is there anyone else out there? This is not about me, but he, you know, I end up in Philadelphia at the Murphy Rec Center. And he's like, we're going to put you in. Basically, it was a dark match with Jay Briscoe. And I'm like, okay, I knew nothing about him. Uh, Mark was so young that Mark, I'm going to say Mark couldn't compete just yet there um, until just a little while later. But he, I believe he was either ringside or around, of course. And I remember going in there and I haven't watched the match. I'd have to dig it up. I'd have to find it somewhere. But I just remember having the showing that I needed. And that, that was, you know, that was obviously give and take there like i remember one thing specifically from the match where there was a there was a spot in the corner where i think maybe i was shot in and i stopped myself in the buckle with the foot and turned around and we did we did the fuck knock pardon my french did the noggin knocker spot and we had butted each other because it was a time in the world where you just didn't fluff anything you you, you we put it in there and we didn't injure each other it was just a solid knock but I remember it being so good that hearing back from at the time uh, from Punk and Samoa, like that he and Samoa Joe had watched the match. Like, geez, like we were just going at it and having a blast. And that helped put me on the map for Ring of Honor. So if that's 02, um, you've got all the years that I worked for Ring of Honor in between Japanese tours. Like I stayed constant in Ring of Honor. And just it's it, like I said, it's it, it it's so much up to him that that helped me out there like you have dead weight it doesn't work for you in the ring like I had a such a capable opponent at that stage in his career think of how young he was yeah. and then when I go to a couple of years later uh we're doing things where it's the second city saints versus the prophecy uh sans Chris Daniels is off in TNA land and it's just Moff and Whitmer against like me and Punk or me and uh Cabana and this match would be myself and Cabana um in a three-way tag against the Briscoes. 
And that was like in Dayton, Ohio, I think. And, you know, just things like that. Uh, I actually dug up another one to talk about, which I have, I hadn't been around Ring of Honor so much. Um, uh, in 06, Punk was already gone and Gabe put us together, myself and Cabana against the Briscoes in Detroit. And the Briscoes looked phenomenal. Like, and I remember the match being good. I remember it feeling good. I watched it last night and I just, I just, just was amazed, not at myself, but just like the way we worked together, the way we clicked. And that was one of the clips that I put online was taking the stuff J driller. Um, like, you know, I trusted them a hundred percent and they were so good, so good at what our art is. Um, Jay, like those guys, I've always said this, that if I, <laughs> if I was in a bar fight, I want those guys. They're, they're going to, they're going to step right up. Like they're with you, they're with you. And that's the meaning of family. Um, they just were always super respectful. I knew they were always family men. I knew they were hard workers. Uh, they'd go home to their families on the weekend. Um, when I last saw them this past July at the ring of honor pay-per-view when they wrestled uh, FTR, I hadn't seen them in years and I saw them both and they were sitting there and, you know, I'm, I'm producer man. So I've got on like, you know, a, a collared shirt, I think probably that day in my badge. And they were like, I was like, look at you guys. Like I'm, I'm just back taking back years. Like, hello, sir. I'm like, what's this sir bullshit? Give me a hug. And we just laughed and it was so good to see them. Like they remain the same guys. And when I see pictures of Jay with his family and the ones that came out with like, you know, I, I actually just like yesterday morning um, or it was like a day ago, a picture of him and his, his daughter just turned 12. And uh, I mean, you'll hear it throughout everyone that talks about these guys. If they knew him just a little um, to share the ring with them was pure bliss, pure bliss. It was exactly what you're looking for. Um, if you're into the type of pro wrestling that we all love, which is, you know, the sport of pro wrestling, um, innovative, always on the mark, uh, your sports entertainment value with, with, you know, Mark's, you know, the Kung Fu, um, just the mean look of Jay. I remember seeing you know, just Jay after all these years and looking, I was like, man, that looks like they, they look like men, you know, they always seem to look like men even when they were 18, 20 years old. And I don't think you could say that for a lot of 18 and 20 year olds, a lot of the time, you know, and uh, just, I, I knew in his heart where his family was. And that was, you know, it was at the forefront. That's everything they did was for his family and to see the pictures throughout the day and things that come out, like it's, it's just heart wrenching for me. I, I feel for his family. I, I feel for his wife. Like, again, like I, I don't, I, I didn't talk to him about these things except like how's the family type thing, like everything good. But I always knew that about them. I always knew that about them. And you could always, you always had that caring aspect of them. If I, I, when I look back, I want to smile about somebody. Is there a story while we're all feeling down uh, that you can share with us that would bring a smile, a, a, a Jay Briscoe smile to everybody's face in, in this sad time? <sighs> Not one in particular. I mean, just just the fact when you see them, it's like you'd light up. Like we shared locker rooms so much that you just light up when you see these people. Like you just smile. Like it's it, it, this business is unique in that. And I'm not sure Lars or you know Dennis. You know, it, when you play sports or you play in a band, you know, you play music. I don't know. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to get in touch with someone, probably. But you know, back in the day where, you know, we just had cell phones, you don't, you know, texting was a thing, but not really a thing. You know, there's no social media that just blip someone a message, say, ah, like your video, like, how you doing, buddy? You know, just to see them each and every weekend, the giant hug they'd give you and the respect they give you and the smile on his face. Like they just were always a crack up to me. They're always happy. There was never any trouble with these guys. Like, I've drank with them. We've been in bars after shows, you know, um, just having a good old time, them getting loud, maybe having too much fun and like, okay, we got to calm down. You're like, okay, you know, you know whoops, we, we got carried away. You're like, not in a bad way, just, just loud and, and boisterous fun, you know, just no particular story. I'm sorry. I don't exactly have one, but just seeing them this past July was hilarious. They called me, sir. I was like, 
what the fuck are you calling me sir for? I'm like, oh man, but, but, just, but look at you. And I'm like, look at me what? Like, I'm still the same guy. I just got to call matches tonight, you know? Like, you guys, I was just so happy to see them. Like, I was, I was excited to get to see them. Like, if more than probably anyone else that I had seen from, like, the Ring of Honor scene. Um, they'd be around those three letters and, like, see them. Um, just because they were synonymous with what, with the heart and soul of what Ring of Honor was. Like, I know they've worked an impact and different things at times, but they are so long associated with the ROH yeah. brand because they carried the banner forever. And through each and everything, like uh, I looked up, I was just looking up through good old cage match.net, like things and where we were. And uh, I, I had seen that it was, there's a night I did a promo with Dusty Rhodes when Dusty came in when Piper didn't, um, when the, uh, ROH hierarchy had changed over and it was Mark Briscoe or I'm sorry Jay Briscoe and Samoa Joe in a cage like I'm like I, I need to go back and watch that like that's got to be phenomenal you know I, I there's just so much stuff that I want to go back and review you know you get lost especially doing things like you know like I do I watch so much wrestling and so much content like, I need to go back and dip into that I bet there's so many gems in that that are forgotten like you know certain spots certain moves like the innovation of what those guys do i mean i'm sure yeah, you'll see a bunch of j drillers lately you know yeah well definitely the one of probably one of the most innovative tag teams of the last couple decades but ace i just want to say thanks from the bottom of my heart taking time out of your day um you know just really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing some memories about mr jay briscoe and for yes. all of us here at the wrestling Pr perspective podcast we're wishing the best to the Briscoe family and, uh, you know, and thanks. Thanks again, Ace. Love you, pal. You're very welcome. Love you guys. And yeah, my best to Jay Briscoe's family and, and Mark and his wife and, and his children and the whole family. Well, listen, when we come back, Rocky Romero will be joining us and uh, we will get in some wrestling talk. And I promise the mood will come up a little bit. But uh, once again, Ace, Lars said it best. Thank you uh, for for doing something as professional as Lars and I think we are, thanks for doing something way more professional than we could do in this moment. And that's talk about Jay with, with the utmost education and respect. My pleasure. Thank you. Lars Fredrickson, there's only one man in this industry that can make me put on a button up shirt for a podcast and daddy did it today. That's Rocky Romero. Rocky, welcome back. We missed you. We are the only people left that you have to talk to. I have no <laughs> friends left. They, they've all left for, yeah. for tons of money. <laughs> you went south. They went north. What, what the fuck, I Rocky? I know. How do you not know. keep friends? At, at some point, you're just going to have to join our podcast. We're doing everything we can to, to get you on. We've talked your friends into leaving you. You're all mm -hmm. by yourself. I mean, you're like a sad 80s song sitting in front of us right now. <laughs> Damn, man. Dennis, you really, you really... Wow! Hit, hit Welcome home, baby. Welcome home. Gosh, that's, that's, do you remember? Yeah. Do you remember when clipping was a penalty in 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 the NFL? That was like <laughs> fucking clipping, like a couple clipping. Right. That was like a personal foul. But you know, I figure <laughs> when he gives people free tickets to wrestling shows, and then you know, the one guy that has loved him the most, the longest, doesn't get free tickets. By the way, I would never have gone. <laughs> but you know, I'm going to pretend for this bit that I'm upset. Uh, I he, he gets a little shade. Just a little. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. Rocky and I have a, have a good relationship. You stole right now, from me. Yeah, well, I did because I'm obviously <laughs> way better looking. And I'm a be and I've always been a better friend. But Rocky, you're, you're down in Mexico as we speak, <laughs> wrestling, <laughs> wrestling for the uh, CMLL, uh, a great old school promotion. I think it's the oldest promotion in Mexico, if I'm, if I'm in, not correct. I think I am. I think correct. it might be the oldest promotion in the world. I think, I think it's you so might be right. From the world, ninety years. It's the down south internet. Yeah, yeah. You oh, broke did up. you guys hear me? I said it was, a little no, bit. I, was, I said, uh, yeah, it's going to be ninety-one years that CMLL has been around. So wow. I think they're the longest running promotion in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Listen, I want to start the questioning off with Wrestle Kingdom. And 
I'll be honest. I am your quintessential American wrestling guy where I'll tune in for the wrestling kingdoms. I support what you guys do because you're a friend or was a friend of mine up until recently because of Lars. But um, all kidding aside, I, I don't know what the atmosphere is like around the event. And I, I, for for me, and this may be a uneducated question, so feel free to educate me. But does it have like the WrestleMania esque uh, atmosphere around it, where there's shows all weekend built around it? There's meet and greets and stuff like that. I I really am enthralled with learning the atmosphere around the Wrestle Kingdom events. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it, it started as you know being the only standalone show kind of during that week. And then there was like some MMA shows that, that started to, you know, pop up in the like mid 2000s, late 2000s, uh, right around uh, the 31st of December or the 1st of January. So, uh, but then we started to see like Noah added a big show, uh, right, you know, two or three days right before Wrestle Kingdom with the headliner of, you know, Nakamura versus Great Muda. And um, DDT does a big show that's around on the same time and there's a bunch of other smaller companies that run Cork and Hall and a bunch of the different halls because now there's so many people coming from other countries over who you know not only love New Japan Pro Wrestling but also would like to see you know wrestlers from other companies DDT and stuff you know because it's like the world is so small now you know it used yeah. to be like back in the day when we were all watching wrestling it was you know you had to find somebody who had like a DVD or a tape or something to watch you know and, and just to get a glimpse of what wrestling in japan was but now you know because you know it, it's on youtube it's you know you see clips all over twitter you know instagram so like you know definitely the world's a lot the wrestling world is a lot smaller and it's a lot easier and it's more accessible than ever well you know i've had the distinct pleasure to actually go to to two of those dome shows what right when they first started to kind of happen um when they were just standalone shows and it's a it was like a five hour long professional wrestling extravaganza and it was like matches that you never thought in, in your in your wildest dreams that would happen you know what i mean certain things took place there that wouldn't take place for the rest of the year um do you feel like now uh, you see like a, there's a lot of uh, americans and a lot of europeans making it a destination it's almost like a holiday destination in january in japan which is freezing fucking cold so are you seeing a lot more you know, people uh, from Europe and United States and all over the world coming to these shows? 100%. So, I mean, pre-pandemic, I think uh, 2020 uh, Tokyo Dome, which was the last dome right before the pandemic, uh, I think we had the biggest influx of, uh, you know, of foreign, you know, tourists coming in for specifically to, you know, to come to Wrestle Kingdom was their primary objective. And then secondary was like, they've never been to Japan or they had been a couple of times prior and they just love Japan. So, you know, which is cool. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it, it is great time because it's right around the holidays where people actually have, you know, they can take a week or two off, you know, so they actually come and like you said, Lars is super cold, but like, it's still a great time to come and visit Japan. And it's a good excuse to get that, you know, that extra time off and, and do Wrestle Kingdom and, and you know, now all the other shows that, that go along with like for for example I know this goes back to what Dennis was, was asking was um even I saw like uh Samurai uh, Del Sol he was doing an autograph session at a you know at a local like this place called Haoming which is like he's uh he's like a wrestling designer slash uh like artist and he ended up doing a, a signing just I think just like a week with like a week advance you know and then you know, but that's like kind of how WrestleMania is, you know, when you go to WrestleMania weekend, it's, you know, things just pop up and you're just like, okay, cool. I got a signing tomorrow. I didn't, wasn't planning on it, but I'm already here. Let's do it. You know, I, I've got some Carl Anderson questions, which we'll jump into, but uh, I guess my follow-up for this before I get to my Carl Anderson question would be, is there anything more uh, the leadership over in Japan new, for New Japan can learn for the way uh, American companies uh, craft big wrestling event weekends with conventions and, and stuff like that, or are they on par with what what we do over here? No, I think that every, they definitely understand uh, that, and you know, and but I think it's just a matter of you know, Wrestle Kingdom itself. The event is such a massive event. I mean, we had twenty six thousand people there. Uh, you know, just this year. And then, like I said, the the year before, uh, sorry, the, the 2020, 
right before the pandemic, we did Wrestle Kingdom over two days with like, it was like 70,000 total, you know, fans over two days. So um, I think that there definitely would probably be some interest, but like those events alone are just, it, it, it kind of just like maxes out, you know, kind of everybody's um, time and, and, you know, that they put into it because, you know, this is a year in the making every time. So I feel like it, maybe if we were a little bit of a bigger company, then I think that we could probably handle like doing, you know, uh, a big convention, an access style convention, maybe, a, you know, whatever, a hall of fame and stuff like that. But I think that, you know, we have, you know, two to three shows, pretty big shows in a matter of two to three days. Uh, and it's just, I think it's just kind of like, and then you're coming off of a holiday, which is like, everybody takes basically like Japan shuts down for like a week and a half right before Wrestle Kingdom. So like everybody's off. So they've done all the preparation, you know, you know, whatever the last minute preparation, like three to four weeks before, then everybody goes off, you know, everybody's off from vacation for a week and a half. And then you come back on the second and then the, the, the show is on the fourth. So you got two days to kind of like do any last, last minute stuff, you know? And we all know your business partner, Carl Anderson, uh, goes to WWE holding one of your prestigious belts. And I'm not sure if you <laughs> talked about this, uh, but I don't listen to a lot of uh, other podcasts other than when you guys were doing yours. And I don't read a lot of the news, so I'm not caught up. So this is a Dennis Farrell question. What was the talks like? Uh with wwe on getting him to the event or was it just one of those it's understood he's under contract he has a belt wherever whatever he does next and i heard rumors i don't know if this was true or not were there any talks of aj Styles showing up to be in carl anderson's corner and now i'm done with okay, the carl so, anderson uh, questions a lot, a lot to unpack there dennis but yeah i've got time <laughs> um, we've got an hour buddy <laughs> um so yeah, you know, uh, when when Carl, you know, was entertaining signing, you know, Carl and 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 Luke were were uh, entertaining signing with WWE. Um, you know, there there was always like, well, we're gonna finish out our dates no matter what, or at least we'd like to finish out our dates. And you know, that's like we're gonna talk to Triple H and you know make sure that he, he thoroughly understands that. So you know, like even though all this was going on, of course it was like stressful because you don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, uh, Triple H, you know, seemed cool, but I never met Triple H. I don't know him, you know? So like, you know, I don't really know exactly what's, what, how it's going to go down. And, uh, you know, but just talking to the guys, you know, they were always like, no, you know, Triple H is cool. He totally understands that he wants us to do the right thing. You know, it's very different than how WWE was prior. So, you know, um, so yeah, so like, uh, so I always felt like somewhat comfortable, but then we had announced, uh, New Japan had announced Carl for the, uh, the Osaka show to defend the title against Hikaleo, which happened to be the same day as the Saudi Arabia show. So then when the Saudi Arabia show and they just got signed, and they just got put into that hot angle with, um, with Phil Balor and his group. Um, so then it was like, they obviously needed them. So you know, they were going to have to pull the card of like, guys, we just signed you. We're going to need you for this show, but we'll make it up to New Japan. So I talked to um, to Triple H himself. He confirmed that, you know, you know, they'll gladly make it up. And, we'll have you. and uh, you know, there was a couple of times where like just getting him, I mean, he's so busy, just getting him on the phone or getting a text back, you know, and just making sure we're all good. You know, he would make it, even though he's probably the busiest man in professional wrestling. So, like, um, you know, I, there was a couple of times where I was, like, worried, but I was just hopeful that it was all going to work out. And then finally, eventually, you know, it did work out. Um, and then as for AJ, so, I mean, there was some talks about AJ possibly coming, but only because AJ himself thought it would be cool if he showed up. You know, so like AJ himself, I think if it was up to AJ and then he didn't get hurt, maybe he would have, you know, shown up, but, um, but there was really nothing official, I'd say. Well, I mean, there's a lot of big news with New Japan and we've talked about it a few times, just to how, how much you guys have grown, you know, just over the course of how many times you've been on this podcast since I've been here. But now when you look at New Japan, it can actually, it looks like it's going to be it's trying to be a major player in the United States. I mean, it is somewhat to a certain degree. I mean, 
with the signing of, you know, Mercedes Monet, right? And then you've got this like cross promotion almost where Carl Anderson can come from the WWE to, you know, defend his champion or, or wrestle, you know, for a, a totally completely different company. I mean, even though there has been a history there, but do you see New Japan coming up to be a major player in the American market? You know, I, I, I think that, you know, we could definitely be like a strong, you know, third brand, you know, authority, third, you know, company. Obviously, like, there's really no competition with WWE. They're just so massive, right? And it's just such a different business model. Uh, AEW is probably second, you know, obviously closest to to what WWE is. And, um, you know, they've been so awesome with sharing their platform with New Japan. You know, Forbidden Door was a massive, massive success last year. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they've always been so great about having our talent and shining our talent, you know, and, and vice versa, you know, letting talent, you know, obviously like Kenny coming over to Wrestle Kingdom was pretty massive. I mean, just the Wrestle Kingdom numbers this year, you know, we have, you know, the, the largest amount of subscribers we've ever had more than, you know, even uh, Kenny versus Jericho, which was like a, obviously a big deal. And that was Jericho's first match outside of WWE in like 20 years. So. Um, so that's just kind of the power, I think, of AEW as well, and and kind of working with them. The relationship has been really, really strong. So, uh, so yeah, Mercedes, and then the addition of Mercedes definitely helped that. Uh, def definitely helped that out a lot. Well, when you see a guy like Omega, I'm sorry to cut you off, Dennis, but like one of the things I do notice is when he's wrestling for New Japan, it's a different Kenny Omega. I mean, it's I don't know if it's because you know of the way the the, the way the ship is run over in New Japan. Or, you know, the difference is obviously AEW is a little bit more outlaw and loose. And maybe, you, you, you know, you've obviously been to both places and been to both locker rooms. Would you say it's more of a, I don't know, is it more, I, I, dare I say this word, professional in the New Japan sort of uh, structure? I think Kenny just knows the audiences, right? Like, he knows... The American, he can get away with what he do in Japan. So Kenny's an amazing, leader. and one of the best things, and one of the most important things, I should say, about you know storytelling is, I mean, is knowing your audience and and how to play. You know, like Lars, you you know, you've been in so many successful bands. Like you, you know, every audience is a little bit different, right? Like European audience is a little different than American audiences. You're like you're not gonna start the you know your set the same way as you would maybe in North America as you would in maybe Japan because maybe they don't know you as well. You got to ease into it, or maybe you had one hit song that was really big over there that wasn't as big, you know, in North America. You know, so like I think that that's just Kenny being aware of all that, mm -hmm. and um, and obviously like his relationship with the fan base there is very different than his relationship with the fan base in North America. Like I would say like in Japan, he's probably one of the most beloved professional wrestlers of all time where, you know, he, he, he could do no wrong. Maybe I think there we're like in North America, you know, everybody seems to have an opinion and they want to let everybody know about it. And uh, you know, what Kenny's doing today, you know, it, it may not mean anything to Kenny now, but like, you know, somebody's got something to say about it. And I think maybe like that may be how he tweaks, you know, his performance. And also like the fact is, you know, they're on TV every week. So they kind of have to keep it spicy, you know, as opposed to like Kenny coming in and doing like a one time or two time deal in New Japan. That's like so different, you know. I want to take this interview back to you. And the last time we talked, you were just so busy podcasting, businesses, wrestling. Now it seems like you have a lot more time on your hands since your buddies left you. Uh, are you guys concerned about the talking <laughs> shop? That in, Dennis. <laughs> I, well, you know, that's what I do best when I'm hurt. I'm jaded, <laughs> you know, you left me. I thought now that your time would be open up, we'd go do picnics in the park. We'd watch wrestling together. You know, call me no more. <laughs> and I find out you and Lars are sharing ice creams and going to wrestling events February 18th in San Diego. Or no, San Jose. Day. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that's two totally different parts of the state. Like a 400 mile difference. You know, <laughs> right, right. San Close Jose enough. is uh, San Jose is way more blue collar. It's about uh, well, the size of the gap in my heart but, right now. Yeah. 
But it, it's actually, it's actually, you know what? Honestly, Dennis, like it's the perfect place for 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 a company like New Japan. I think it's, hmm. you know, it's such a, and it's going to be such a loaded show. Continue. I digress. But what what about the Talk and Shop brand? Because you've had the massively successful podcast. You have alcohol. You have, you know, uh, wrestling pay per views. At least two of them. What's what is that uh, looking like as far as their return? WWE, your your large larger role in new japan aew and other companies at this moment it's just completely halted you know we've just you know we're not doing anything we don't have no you know no collaborations coming up or anything um but you never know you know you never know um you know what'll happen obviously like, like there's obviously some things that are being shaken up but you know up in WWE right now. And I hope that nothing changes, you know, for, for the guys, you know, I want them to be super successful. They're, you know, two of my best friends in the world. And, uh, you know, I want them to have very long careers in WWE for their family and for, you know, for their sake. But, um, but yeah, you never know. I mean, even, uh, oh, nice. <laughs> this new, um, Can you guys hear, you know, leadership role that Triple H has, you know, maybe there is room for, you know, collaborations with other people. So like, you know, maybe there is a, a world where Talk and Shop could, you know, be co-branded by somebody who works for New Japan and two guys that work for WWE. I mean, I think it's, you know, very possible. It seems like they're being, you know, pretty lenient with what people do outside as opposed to like a year ago or two years ago, or even three years ago. So, um, you know, never say never. And, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe something will come down, you know, come up down the road. I would love to do a pay-per-view. I mean, I'd love to do another Talk and Shop a Mania pay-per-view. And it would be cool if there was a way to make that happen with those guys being a part of WWE. Um, obviously we probably couldn't write it the same way that we would, you know, when they weren't in WWE, but, uh, but yeah, I think it could be awesome if there was some kind of involvement or at least, you know, even if they're just executive producers, you know, I have the million dollar ideal for you, Rocky. Remember the fake hey. diesel and fake King, or is that fake diesel in a uh, razor fake razor? Yeah. Lars and I can be Carl Anderson. And that's right, the big LG. <laughs> we could be the fake ones. Huh? There's something to that. There's something I, to that. I don't There's need that guy. Team, uh, I, I see. I don't need a TV dick, though. Mine's just fine. <laughs> so I'm Carl. Well, there, there it is. <laughs> I was going to flip you for it, but you can have it. <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a genius idea, honestly, Dennis. I mean, I, I have to say. So, what do you think, Rocky? We I end? mean, I think I think yeah, I think we can make that happen. You know, if we did, we end up doing Talk and Shop in Mania Three, like we promised to do two, you know, for the last two years, we finally make it happen, uh, or I should say, I finally make it happen now. Then, uh, then yeah, you guys are in. Yes. <laughs> fake LG and fake Carl Anderson, fake machine gun. Yeah, be, I could. <laughs> I'll do that whole thing. You know, I mean, I got that <laughs> shit. Um, well, you know, you're doing this big show in San Jose. I mean, I think to myself, you guys have a big signing with Mercedes. You know, there's obviously other American talent that is, that is huge out there that you, that you guys probably could sign. Um, but of all, you know, I would think that, you know, doing something like this would be like in a, more of a major city. What, how did San Jose, because it's the, the second time now you've run this town, I, I kind so of I, want to, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think it's the third time that we're going to run it. And um, to be honest, you know, I think that that market, kind of Northern California, is kind of an underserved market in professional wrestling. Uh, there's a ton of fans. Uh, it's extremely accessible from you know so many places on the West Coast, and uh, you know, and and it's an easy. I mean, it's a major city. You know, you fly into San Francisco, or you can fly. There. Later served, you know, wrestling populace that that really enjoys wrestling, you know. So, um, and we found that out when we did the um, what's the 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 big uh, arena in San Fran? Oh, um, the, uh, Cow Palace. Cow Palace, yeah. So when we did the Cow Palace, I mean, we we did a great number there. So I I feel like there's just a lot of fans there that that definitely get it and really like professional wrestling and get like what New Japan is and how cool it can be. So I feel like um, you know. 
showing up there every year is, is really important. It seems like this iteration of New Japan America has been so much more successful than the dojo of the past. What did you guys learn from that first attempt at New Japan in the United States that you're doing different now? It's a completely different beast. It's just such a completely different beast. You know, the, like the original dojo back that was opened back in 2002. I mean, it was like a, it was a personal gym that Antonio Inoki wanted to to get made. And he had the vision, obviously, like of using that of, as a place to train wrestlers and fighters to go back to Japan and whether it be New Japan or Pride at that time or whatever. But like that was going to be his his kind of like the, the heartbeat of it all. But um, but the world wasn't there yet. You know, we didn't have the technology that we we have now that would, uh, you know, open up the doors, you know, to, to be in every single home, you know, in the world, you know, in some kind of way, whether it's through YouTube or or, uh, you know, whatever, Fight TV or something, you know. So, um, you know, it just the world wasn't really caught up. The vision was there and the idea was there, but you, know, it, you wouldn't have been able to make it happen. And now you can easily make that happen. And, you know, everybody kind of picks and chooses what they want to watch and what they like. And, you know, so it's kind of like perfect for, you know, a, a professional wrestling company like New Japan, which is, you know, based in Asia and but is able to come over to America and do shows, you know, often. Is there is there a plan for New Japan to bring an office into America? We have one. Well, I mean, we have an office. You know, yeah, like we I have mean, an office in Los Angeles. Right. Yeah, no, but we I'm have. I mean, we, we go ahead, go ahead, Lars. No, I was just I was thinking more of like a like a like a a bi coastal kind of thing, you know, where it's it seems like in Japan there's the reach is everywhere, right? You know, and in America. Mm -hmm. And there's Canada and there's Mexico, these types of things. And if you had, you know, I'm just thinking like, what's, what's the world domination plan? Right. Right. I mean, it, I guess, yeah. Like the scalability of it all is like, I mean, I think that's, that's a really big undertaking, you know, that would obviously cost a lot of money. And I think you would probably lose a lot of money in the beginning. So, and, you know, New Japan's not really in the, in the, uh, you know, they're not the type of, no, they've been around for, you know, 50 years or whatever, you know, they, they're very smart. And the reason they've been around for 50 years is, you know, they kind of pick and choose their battles kind of wisely, you know? So uh, instead of just dumping a bunch of money and I think into, you know, just having a promotion and running shows and just doing that over and over and over until hopefully it catches on or like people get into it. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of risky, I think, you know, so I think that's better to, to be smart about it, you know, choose, um, you know, what cities we go to wisely, like San Jose is a great city. Like I said, that's been great, you know, we're able to sell it out already. And, um, you know, and, you know, we can go to New York, we can go to Chicago, we can go to LA, we can sell those out pretty easily. So um, now I think it's just uh, kind of fine tuning the product here and kind of, you know, in making improvements, like, you know, where it counts, like to product, you know, when it comes to production, you know, uh, you know, help you know having aw help us with a lot of things you know like promotional stuff having impact and access has been super important in growing our audience and, and getting a more stable uh you know hardcore audience you know has, has, is, is really important so i think those are all the tools that we need to be doing obviously i think we need more exposure just in general then we could probably take those steps you know that you're talking about like open you know being being a, a completely bi you know, production where we're going back and forth, you know, every week, every other week, you know, whatever it might, might be. But uh, I think we, we need those other kind of key steps first, you know, whether it be like a T, you know, a bigger, you know, a big TV partner or a big streaming deal or something like that, I think would, would help us to be more successful faster. You know, in the, past, the old school way, you know, you know, doing podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know in the past Lars and I talk about how impact is viewed kind of as a develop developmental ter territory at times 
But you know, in the past, New Japan has been the place where people go, become big stars, both for other companies. And I know at times it's left a bad taste in New Japan's mouth. Now, the last couple of years, we see you guys being more proactive in the free agent market. You go out and you do the Chris Jericho thing, which was huge. And it felt like a, a game changer or a moment for that company. Now, you know, Mercedes Monet, uh, you go out and, and grab her when literally no one else could. Where did that change in thinking or that change in aggressiveness from the company side come from? Honestly, I, I think a lot a lot of it has to do with, you know, just kind of being that New Japan is such a unique product and it, and it's such like, a, you know, for, for especially a hardcore wrestling fan, it's like, a, it's just a really cool, interesting product. You know, it's shot completely different in Japan. It's, uh, it looks different. Um, the wrestling is, is even feels different, even though like a lot of it could be pretty much the same type of matches. It's just it, the, the pacing is different and everything. So I feel like for a lot of wrestlers, you know, especially, you know, if they came, you know, through North America or whatever, they went straight to WWE or they went, you know, whatever now AEW or whatever impact that, um, they want to cross that, you know, off the bucket list of going and wrestling for New Japan, doing a Wrestle Kingdom. I mean, a Wrestle Kingdom, not as big as WrestleMania, but maybe the second kind of biggest thing, you know, it's kind of the most unique thing that's that's like that, you know, like where else can you go and do, you know, wrestle in front of 30,000 people, 40,000 people in one night, you know? So um, I think that uh, for a lot of people that they want, you know, a lot of wrestlers, they want to check that, check that off their bucket list and then be like i was kind of like trying to think of like how to compare new japan and like wwe or AEW, and it's like wwe and AEW are like like if this was like the movie business they would be like the really big studios you know they're doing marvel movies they're doing this and that you know and i think that new japan would be more like a a bigger uh, it's still like a major, but like an independent, like a Miramax or something like that, you know, something like, and I think that's so like, yeah, everybody wants to do the big budget movies, you know, you're going to make the most money, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, it's going to be great for your career in the long run, but like, secretly, everybody really wants to do the, you know, the lower budget indie films that like, with the media roles, you know, and I think that that's kind of the, the comparison between, you know, WWE, AW versus New Japan. Well, you know, with your leadership role in the company New Japan and, and being somewhat of a diplomat in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? Because you handle so many different things. Num number one, you're a great in-ring talent, obviously. Can't take that away from you, even though you don't have any friends left. I mean, obviously, me and Dennis are here to fill that gap. But, I mean, are you part right. of these decisions bringing the, the American talent in? Are you, are you a liaison, so to speak? Are you the one... That's like maybe giving the office uh, uh, ideas on on what the next move could be because you know your 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 feet are firmly planted in the state of California. Well, not now. He's in Mexico. Well, whatever. My point is, <laughs> no, I got you, Rocky. Right, right. No, one hundred percent. I mean, um, I've definitely always been, you know, uh, you know, some kind of talent scout or like a liaison because you know, you know. Because this is Japanese company, you know, like I feel like, I, you know, for the last maybe almost 10 years, I've been some kind of starting point, whether it was official or not official, you know, now it's, it's a bit more on the official side, you know, so, um, you know, I, and luckily I have, uh, you know, because I've been doing this, for these really great relationships, you know, like all the guys that were, you know, that I came up with, you know, Ring of Honor and in the LA dojo. I mean, they're all mega stars now. So like I have, you know, I can call them up. I can, you know, and say, Hey, well, you know, like, or they can call me up and reach out and be like, Hey, you know, I really want to come and do Russ kingdom. And it's like, okay, well, cool. Let's see if we can try to make it happen. You know, at least that's the first step of, of getting things kind of going. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, that's definitely the role that I've like filled in the last few years, uh, as well as like looking for the next generation, you know, like when we created new Japan strong, that was the idea of like, you know, during the pandemic, you know, everybody was separated. We didn't know what to do. You know, we still needed to make content for a new Japan world. We created strong and, uh, you know, had to go and find a completely new roster, you know, of a bunch of talented wrestlers 
that could have filled in and come over to Japan at any moment. So um, you definitely, you know, heavily involved in that, heavily involved in uh, in the U.S. product itself, and always trying to figure out how to make the main product better and pop. You know, so like, you know, Mercedes, like, you know, working with uh, WWE to make Carl Anderson, you know, happen, and um, you know, obviously Kenny as well. You know, uh, was you know, integral in, in in working with Kenny to to get that happen for the Tokyo Dome. And, uh, and then also like Forbidden Door working with Tony's, you know, side by side, you know, every week for months, you know, and, uh, you know, talking to him and, and trying to get everybody to agree on the matches, agree on this, like what's, you know, what it, all the background stuff, but working with AEW has been, you know, a breeze when it comes to that. It's just, it's just a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, Lars was on to something, and I kind of want to piggyback off his question of when you have this strong talent and you send them over to Japan, you know, we all talk about the WWE style and New Japan has its own style. And certainly the fans are, are way more drastically different than us here in America. Do you still kind of have to prep wrestlers before going over with like, hey, listen, just so you know, when you get over there you're not going to get the same reaction or you need to do a b and c to make to get any sort of reaction out of them or do they kind of already know um i think for most for the most part people can kind of do their own like research about it you know um obviously like it also uh, you know depends on the situation so at you know now in the pen you know whatever you want to say, you know, coming out of the pandemic or whatever, you know, still there's a lot of rules and regulations in each arena and each arena is different, right? So, uh, you know, some arenas, they still only allow clapping with no cheering. Some arenas be 50% with cheering, you know, a Tokyo Dome was completely, you know, was, was at full capacity with cheering, but still fans are still a little timid uh, to go ahead and go back to where they were pre-pandemic. So you just kind of got to go with the culture because in in Japan, it's, you know, if it's like, um, it's a level, I think like four or something or level two, whatever it is, it's like one of the highest pandemic, you know, degrees, you know, by their version of what the CDC is, you know, so like they, they're taking it, you know, extremely serious. So like nobody's in a rush to, I think, to like just go nuts, you know, just yet. Now, I think when that drops and they're talking about it dropping in April, probably all of that will disappear. And then we'll really start to see fans like come back and in droves and, and hopefully, you know, start cheering like they were pre pandemic. So, um, you know, I think it, like, you know, people, people, you know, sometimes they ask when they're, you know, uh, for pointers and things like that. Tokyo Dome's a crazy place because it's so big you go out there and you can, you know, be, you'll be talking on the mic and there's this crazy reverb because it's so huge. And then, so when you start talking, you can hear yourself in a really weird way. And then it bounces back at you. And it's just like, kind of takes you out of the moment a little bit. It, it could. So, um, you know, that's definitely a thing that probably people aren't, uh, aren't used to as well. You know, it's just very different, you know, yeah, that building is definitely acoustically a little strange, I would say. Yeah. Um, but the For atmosphere sure. when, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing everything kind of go back to normal there. Because when you watch, you know, that crowd get invested and get excited, you know, you can't help but feel that same, you know, passion. And that's probably what made me a fan of Japanese wrestling was also the fans and their reaction, their responses mm -hmm. to the wrestlers, even though the commentary was in Japanese, I had no fucking idea what was going on, but I knew the <laughs> players. So that was good enough. I guess if I had one last question for you, Rocky, like, you know, I, we've had you on a few times here. Your, your role seems to get more and more deeper into uh, the office uh, part of the business. Did you ever think that this was going to be the future of you in the sense where you're going to have that much control power and respect to make these kinds of decisions i know that's a very uh, unhumbling yeah, I mean, question you know but. <laughs> i mean honestly not at this level you know i feel like um i'm extremely proud of you know the accomplishments that i've you know had over the last couple of years and i mean they're really big wins i feel like you know like getting kenny to the tokyo dome after you know kenny 
uh, left to form AEW. And, you know, there was kind of a bit of a miscommunication between the New Japan office and Kenny and like what Kenny wanted, even though, you know, like the, the, the former president at the time was, you know, didn't really understand it. So like to, to be able to go back and, and help to mend that, and not only that, but like have a huge home run success with, you know, Omega versus Osprey, uh, you know, people talking about that it could be the, you know, the greatest match that they've ever seen or one of them. It's, I mean, that's like, that's like, dude, that's like something that I helped, I helped put together. You know, I wasn't the one who went out there and hit the home run. That was the guys, you know, but like, um, you know, just being a part of it to bring, you know, kind of bring it all together is, is massive, you know, like I said, bringing Forbidden Door together with Tony and AW and New Japan, you know, like all these different, uh, you know, you know, two big organizations with two different ways of looking at wrestling and a bunch of stars that, you know, have never met or talked maybe and bringing them all together in one roof. That's, I mean, that's a huge, huge home run as well. So like, uh, I definitely never thought I would be doing it on this level. And it's kind of crazy that I am. And um, I don't know, I'm just, I feel humble and I feel, I feel pretty fortunate. Well, I just wanted to point that out that there's, you know, two players to all this stuff and what the fans have been able to see. You've played a big part in that. And I don't think you get that much credit. I think it's always like the owners of the companies or whatever, but there's always that guy. And I know that you're a humble motherfucker and that's why I love you so much. But I just wanted to point that out is that a lot of this stuff wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a Rocky Romero. So kudos to you, my man. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Whoa, whoa, I got one last question. You're not getting... No, 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 no. That was the perfect <laughs> outro, bro. I'm already I being mean, boxed th- out. This was best friends here. Best friends. Turn best... In next, tune in next week as Lars Fredrickson and Rocky Romero host the Wrestling Perspective podcast. I mean... <laughs> Listen, we were we're we're bumping Mickey James. Of course, she won her match. We Lars and I we text each other right afterwards, like, oh, we got played on our interview uh, with the last rodeo. <laughs> but my last question kind of goes into that. When you hear an interview with someone like a Mickey James who was on this podcast talking about, you know, the one thing she really wants to do is wrestle in Japan. Or, you know, uh, the week before where Josh Alexander says, I want to defend the Impact Championship in Japan. Uh, mm-hmm. I know you see these, this well, stuff. Well, you know what, Dennis? Sorry to kick, but there, there is, I know there's a few major, major wrestling stars who've never wrestled for a Japanese promotion that are there, mm-hmm. that are there for the taking. So I'm just saying that. Go ahead, Dennis. Fake Carl Anderson and fake with Big LD. <laughs> Oh, but, what are you guys doing next January? I, <laughs> Tokyo <laughs> Dome, bro. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, I know you're kind of plugged in. You see the headlines. When you see these wrestlers talk about wrestling Japan, your mouth waters a little bit. Do you do you immediately, you know, yell at someone to get you Mickey James's number and figure out how to get this thing going? And not well, Mickey I mean, James in particular, but I'm just right, right. as an example. I mean, honestly, those are well, hey, hey, hang on, Rocky. I want this answer, and your yeah, yeah. your your overseas yeah. internet is not working real good. Oh, are okay. you back yet? All right, I want okay. that start over. Oh, here we go. Yeah, let me try that again. So, I, I I think that um you know both those names that you mentioned, Josh and and Mickey, would be two amazing people to get over and. It's fortunate enough that, you know, they were, they both work for Impact and Impact is a New Japan partner. You know, I mean, we are on the same cable station, uh, access to TV every Thursday night, don't miss it. And um, so, uh, you know, I've I've been trying to figure out with Scott Demore of like how we can do more things together with Impact and Josh and Mickey are two names that constantly come up because I think, you know, Mickey being the legend that she is, and having her come over to Japan and maybe working with like some younger stardom girls could be so sick. And yeah. Josh is, you know, tailor made for for one hundred percent. You know, he's like, a, you know, he's like the second coming of Kurt Angle. You know, so um, yeah, I think he would he would really thrive there working with like a Tanahashi or you know some of the big name talent. So like it just hasn't happened yet, but um, I feel like it. You know, we're on the cusp of something like that happening. I have a question, but I'm going to ask it to you off here because I don't want to put you on the spot. That's how much I like you as a friend. <laughs> so, uh, and it'll stay but between us. But Rocky, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Uh, at Azuka Rock, 
A-Z-U-C-A-R-R-O-C on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can also find me uh, on CMLL. You know, you can watch me on CMLL. You can watch me on New Japan Pro Wrestling. I occasionally will show up on AEW Dynamite and Rampage. I will occasionally show up on uh, Impact Pro Wrestling. So uh, I'm kind of all over the place. And, you know, like like Lars said, you know, I'm, I've kind of become the uh, the ambassador to New Japan Pro Wrestling kind of world. And, uh, you know, I'm just really, honestly, I'm just living my best life. I'm totally living my best life. You know, uh, I, you know, I've been able to uh, make a bunch of relationships, you know, get people over to Japan, you know, bring some of the, the Japanese town over to America to make it easier for people to see. And I don't know, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm really loving what I'm doing. And uh, I hope to have an, another great year of doing even more. Well, well I, I mean, can't... honestly, I just want to end it off with this. You kind of got Andre the Giant status. If you really think about it, <laughs> who was able to go from territory to territory to territory for different promotion to different promotion? I mean, there wasn't a lot of guys who were able to do that. And you, if you think about it, you're, you've done right, like, right. I mean, I mean, I know it's a different world now, but you kind of sneak in, you know, and to hold, you know, the power and, you know, I don't know. It's, it's pretty amazing to watch. And when the annals of history are written about this decade, I hope your name's on top of the list of somebody who made a change for the business for the better. So thanks again, Rocky. February 18th, is there still tickets available? Is that sold out? There are no tickets available. I heard a small rumor that there could be just like a maybe a hundred or so tickets maybe put out, um, but I'm not even sure if those are really even available. I don't know how true that is, but the best way to watch it would be on Fight TV live February 18th. Uh, it's 19.99, it's super cheap. And, uh, you know, go on there, watch it. We're going to, we're having some amazing production. You know, we're up in our production for this. You know, we, we'll, we just got told that the, uh, the Japanese TV crew is going to come in to shoot it. Oh, wow. So, um, so yeah, so it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to have the feel of a really big new Japan show and, um, you know, you, you're not going to want to miss it. Mercedes money versus Kyrie for the IWGP women's title. We know that there will be an IWGP world heavyweight title defense between either Kazuchika Okada or Shingo Takagi. And um, what else we got? Oh, Switchblade Jay White versus Eddie Kingston. This is a long time coming for the people who watch New Japan Strong. Uh, we also have Homicide versus Tom Lawler in a filthy rules fight, which is like no ropes, no rules type of fight. Um, we've got Bobby Fish versus David Finley, Alex Coughlin versus J.R. Kratos, and a bunch more matches that will be announced pretty soon. It's going to be a hell of a card. Rocky Romero, thank you so much for hanging out with us. For everybody at home, the show's over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Lars Fredrickson, UK Tour coming up. Make sure you go check that out. Your Whatnot app, go over there. He's always auctioning off uh, records. I just, I still want to give you your, your comeuppance, okay? Listen, you're a famous wrestling podcaster, sometimes musician. When you get back into music, I want to let people know. All right, that's it. All right, so thank you, everybody. Wrestling Perspective, have a good night. We'll see you later.